It's biology with Mr. B. Biology with Mr. B. That's me! Hello to all Year 7s that are watching this. So, uh, if you don't know me, I am Mr. Bexton. I am a biology teacher at Kevix. You might see me. I'm, no, I'm the really little one that like randomly bounces around the science department, um, occasionally jumps on things, or if I'm in a bad mood, just looks like I want to just be evil at everyone. Either way. I have been asked to put together a piece of work for you on the topic of organ systems and health. So I have, and I've done it in this way. So a YouTube video uh, coupled with a PowerPoint that I can go through, actually teach things to you to the best of my ability. Um, and I've set little tasks and little things that you can do that hopefully, not only can you do them at home, you can hopefully do them in a way that is fun. And will hopefully get some... Yeah, there'll be some good learning going on, but also some, might hopefully be really, really just engaging and fun and things that you might actually want to do, which um, would be awesome. Because that's that's why I'm a science teacher. I want you to love science. I want you to love biology. So I really hope you love what I've got for you. So there are four parts uh, to your learning over the next couple of weeks. Um, part one is the skeleton. Part two is about muscles. Part three is about joints. And part four is about breathing and your gas exchange systems. So I'm going to start this in terms of what you actually physically have to do for me task wise now. Those two bits in red are the only two bits that you have to do over the next couple of weeks. They're the only two things that we put into sims that you have to complete and they'll be the only two things that your teachers will be checking. Now, obviously, there, there are lots of other little tasks, little questions, little things you can do in this lesson, in this PowerPoint, in this video. But all the others are optional extensions or optional challenges if you've actually got time to do them. We're in a very awkward situation where not everyone has the same amount of time as others. Some of you will be sat there and maybe you maybe maybe you're really lucky that both your parents are at home um, and they can help you and maybe you don't have any younger siblings. Some of you will be there with maybe only one parent or a grandparent or someone and you've got all these younger siblings running around which makes it really difficult to work. Um, we're all in a different boat and we have to accept that. And the only thing I need from all of you is to try your best. So even if there's some of you out there that are maybe maybe you're struggling to get these two red things done, the quiz and the home practical when I'm setting, if you're struggling to get that done in time, that's absolutely fine. You just need to let me or Mrs. Benyon know, okay, or your teacher know over red modo. Okie doke. So are you ready to go? Let's start part one, the skeleton. So uh, the learning objective is to understand the structure and function of the human skeleton. Let's have a look. So your skeleton has four, one, two, three, four main functions. The function of support. Oh, look at that. Look at this PowerPoint animation. Watch this bounce in. Boom. You know, if that isn't cool, it, it's not cool. Okay, I'll keep going. Support is a function of the skeleton. Protection is a function of the skeleton. Movement is a function of the skeleton. And my favourite is making new blood cells is a function of the skeleton. Let me just go into a bit more detail in terms of actually what these four statements are actually on about. Support. When we say support, your skeleton supports the body and it literally holds your internal organs in their place. If your rib cage was not there, your heart and lungs, they're just two of the organs inside your rib cage, quite a lot more, your heart and lungs would not be in their places. They would just be sort of bouncing against your skin inside your chest. That wouldn't be very helpful. Protect. I'll keep with the rib cage. The skeleton's there to protect your vital organs. If your rib cage was not there, and maybe you got a little bump on your chest, well, that bump would go straight to your heart and lungs and damage them. But because your rib cage is there, it protects them. Movement. Your skeleton is connected to your muscles via tendons. Which means every time your muscles move, the muscles pull on the tendons, which pull on your skeleton, and it causes you to move as well. 
And the last one. This is my favourite as a biologist. Making new blood cells. Did you know inside your bone marrow, which is like the, the bit in the middle of your bone, did you know there were stem cells? Cells that have the potential to become lots of other different types of cells, not just bone cells, other types of cells too. And stem cells in your bone marrow can be used to make new blood cells. Stem cells is a brilliant topic to look at as a biologist. I'm not going to set that now. You've got enough to be getting on with. But if you ever do want something cool to look at in biology, research what stem cells can be used to treat. How stem cells could be used to cure paralysis. How stem cells could be used to grow a brand new heart for someone. Look it up. It's really cool. Promise. Anyway, classic body, classic skeleton person. Um, I don't know, I'm, you know, maybe an extension task right now. Could we go, you know, go and watch the film Coco? It's awesome. Still, you do need to have an appreciation of what different parts of the skeleton are called. So the names of the bones. So I have labelled this skeleton to help you, and I've done it with all the really, really posh names. I'm, I don't care that you're year seven, I don't care you're only 11 or 12, you're going to have the proper names. Let's do this. So start at the top, your head, your skull. It's the skull's posh name is your cranium, your cranium. If I keep going downwards, your jaw, the posh name of the jaw is the mandible. The mandible is your jawbone. Again, I'm going to just going to worm my way down. After the mandible, you have your start of your spinal cord in your neck. So the spinal cord's posh name here is the vertebrae. So it's your vertebrate. I mean, we are vertebrates. We have backbones. And it's your vertebrae is the posh name for spinal cord. If you keep working down, okay, your collarbone. Collarbone is the clavicle up here. And your breastplate the bit that is the in between the middle of the ribs, the bit the ribs come out of, is called the sternum. Okay, let's look at the down the arms now. Your main arm that connects shoulder to elbow is the humerus. What a great name for your funny bone, eh? <laughs> humerus. Oh god, it's, no, I'm sorry, it's just that's not even a good dad joke. That, that's just awful. Really, I'm really sorry. Uh, keep going. To the lower arm, these two, you have your ulna and you have your radius. Now, it's difficult on this diagram to see which is which, but if you hold your arm out straight, okay, so the back of your hand is facing uh, upwards, so the back of your hand is facing the ceiling, the ulna is underneath and the radius is on top. So the ulna is underneath, you and you, radius is on top. So that's how you can, if, if you can feel your bones in, in your arm, I can just about, despite my uh, excessive Easter egg eating over April, um, I can still just about feel my bones and the ulna is underneath and the radius is on top. Let's look some more. So ribcage, it, yeah, its posh name is still ribcage. So that's quite a nice one, isn't it? Okay, we have a part of the spinal cord again, but this spinal cord now is going down the lower back towards your hips. So it is still called your vertebrae. So that entire vertebrae goes all the way from your hips all the way up to your neck. It is not one bone. It is lots of bones fused together. Okay, lots of bones fused together, but all together we call it your vertebrae. The hip has a posh name. The hip's called your pelvis. Your pelvis. And that pelvis connects the vertebrae and both your legs. So the top part of your leg, and this is now the largest bone in your body, is called the femur. The largest bone in your body is called the femur. Even in short people like me, my femur is still my largest bone. You then have your knees. Knees are a posh name. They are the patella. Patella is a posh name for your knee. And we've got two legs. There's two le yes, we do have two legs. There you go. That's some amazing biology for you. I didn't mean two legs. I mean, we've got two bones in the lower leg between your ankle and your knee. Just like you have two bones in the lower part of your arm before your hand between your elbow. Now, the main bone is the tibia. 
and the shin bone, which is just um, over the top of that, is the fibula. So the tibia is the main sort of bone going all the way down, but at the front of the tibia you have your fibula. So the fibula's on top and the tibia's behind it. Okay, my final bones I can talk about, at least that I can talk about that are labelled on this diagram, are the ankle bones and the bones that are in your toes and, and fingers. So your ankle bones are called tarsals. Now it's not labelled here, but we've also got this very similar bones here in your wrist called carpals. C-A-R-P-A-L-S. Carpals. Now, if I go back to the ankle, so the ankle bones are the tarsals, there's lots of them, and they branch off into, again, just before you get to the, so we're in the foot now, but before you get to your toes, they branch off into metatarsals, in the same way that your carpals in the wrist branch off into metacarpals. The final bones are your fingers and toes, and those final bones are called phalanges. What an amazing name, phalanges. You know, this is my first optional task that you can have a go at. It is the post-it note game, and it's a game that I used to play at university for several different reasons, but you can do this one to do the skeleton to do with bones. So what you can do, copy the names of those different bones from the previous slide through the skeleton, so just rewind me and get them back and copy those names on the different post-it notes and line just put all the post notes down like on a table or on the floor in a nice random order and then time yourself sticking those post-it notes to the correct parts of your body can you get them all right that's the first part can you get them all in the right place and secondly how quick can you do it challenge your parents Challenge your friends over FaceTime, over Skype. Challenge your brothers and sisters, especially if it's like, if it's like a little brother and then you'll like definitely win. So like, awesome. Give it a go. It'd be a really fun way, hopefully, to actually get those names of the bones into your, into your brain so that you can remember them too. All right, next up, part two, muscles. You have to know how antagonistic muscles work. What a word that is, antagonistic. It's like the villain, isn't it? Villain from a book, the antagonist. So and how antagonistic muscles work to move the skeleton. So one of the functions of the skeleton was movement. So now we have to explain and learn how that happens. So muscles. Muscles are a type of tissue. You might remember from the first topic, cells and all about cells, that a tissue is a group of cells which work together to perform a specific function. So muscles are groups of muscle cells that work together to cause movement in your body. And there are lots of different types of muscles in your body. There are some that are voluntary, so they only work, they only contract when you tell them to. I don't mean like shower them, bicep, contract. No, no, like you, you would obviously think about it and your brain would send an electrical impulse, a message to your bicep which causes it to contract. You're in control of that bicep. Your bicep shouldn't be contracting randomly at any sort of random time of the day. You're in control. But there are some muscles that are involuntary, muscles that you can't control, muscles that we say are automatic. So your heart, your heart is continuously contracting, relaxing throughout the entirety of your life. Yet at no point have you ever had any conscious control over doing that. Now your brain is involved in speeding it up and slowing it down, but again, you don't think about that. You can't sit there right now listening to me and go, oh, increase my heart rate. It won't happen. It's all automatically done. Blinking is 99.9% .9 of the time involuntary. You don't control it. You just do it. Every single minute, you are blinking six, seven, eight, nine, ten times without even knowing. And you're doing that to move all those the fluid around your eyes around. And that helps prevent infection from bacteria via your eyes. But well, obviously, we all know if you wanted to blink, you can. Like, just make yourself blink now. Your eyes close. There you go. It's a blink. So there are some muscles that are a bit of both, mainly involuntary, but your brain can override it if possible and then make it become voluntary. 
One of my favourites that is an involuntary muscle is the diaphragm. Your diaphragm is a muscle that we're going to actually learn about very in a sec in this video. It's the muscle that controls your breathing. So again, 99.9% .9 of the time, you don't have to think about breathing to breathe. You just breathe, don't you? It just happens. That's why, you know, when you're asleep, you still breathe. But it, chances are right now, you're probably actually thinking about your breathing and therefore you're controlling it, whether you breathe in, whether you breathe out, in, out, in, out, shake it all about. And you know, there's always there's always a few of you probably still sitting there right now going, oh, my days, like, I'm like, how do I breathe? How often do I breathe? How often should I breathe in? Uh, what should I do? So let's just change the subject and get back into learning because then you'll forget about it and then you'll just go back to normal breathing that's involuntary. There are lots of different muscles in your body that we could look at. And you, you don't need to know any actual singular muscle. You don't need to be able to label a body with muscles. But we just put this in just again, just a bit of extra info. Just hopefully, you, hopefully you'll be able to recognise most of these muscles though. So you've got like at your chest, you've got your pecs, your pectorals, uh, sort of between the basically the sort of the, between the shoulder and the arm muscles, you've got the deltoids. Uh, in the arms, you've got your biceps on the front and triceps on the back. Um, if you actually look at your back, where your neck is, that's your trapezius, and your main back muscles going left and right is your latimus dorsi. Uh, if I, you know, if you're like me and you've got a you've got an eight pack, you know, you heard eight pack. There are eight abdominal muscles um and and yeah they're called abdominals your abs and uh this uh little bottom here is the gluteus maximus what an amazing name your bum is literally the gluteus maximus awesome on your legs the front of your legs you have your quadriceps and on the back of your upper leg you've got your hamstring your hamstring if I keep going down, your calf muscles here are also called the gastrocnemius. So, lots of muscles. You can probably probably imagine what my favourite muscle name is. Just It's got Maximus in the name, and it might be really big. It's, oh, it's just cool. Still, moving on. How do they actually work? Muscles contract. And when muscles contract, they get shorter. They can only pull. They can't push. And all muscles are connected, not all, but most are attached to bones by something called a tendon. So if you can see the diagram here on the right hand side, you can see the bone, you can see your humerus, and then your ulna and radius. Ulna is that first one. Okay, radius is the one. That is closer to the top of the arm. So the bicep, when you contract it, look how it's got shorter compared to its tricep muscle, which is on the back. The tricep is all the way from here up to here. That's much longer than the contracted bicep, which is there to there. And that bicep, because it's got shorter, it's pulled on the tendon, which has pulled on the ulna bone, and it has caused your arm to be raised. Now, because muscles can only pull, we can't push. That bicep can't. Oh, get rid of that. The bicep can't just push the tendon and the and the ulna back into place. There would need to be a second muscle to make the other type of movement happen. That second muscle is the tricep. And because they work together. All pairs of muscles that work together are called antagonistic muscle pairs. When one muscle contracts, the other one relaxes, and then vice versa. So if we look at the bicep-tricep one again, to bend your arm, the bicep muscle contracts and gets shorter. It pulls on the tendon, which pulls on the arm bone, and moves the arm upwards, bends it. And at the same time, the tricep has relaxed and it's become really long. And if you want the arm to straighten again, what you need to do is the tricep this time will contract and get shorter and the bicep will relax and get longer. 
It is now the tricep which is pulling on a tendon, which is pulling on the radius bone now, and that causes it, the arm, to straighten. When one contracts, the other relaxes. They are antagonistic muscle pairs. Right, another little optional experiment this time you can carry out. It is possible, using household equipment, to measure how much force each of your muscles can make. The only equipment you'll need are some scales, the type you stand on, the ones in my bath, like the ones in my bathroom that tell me every morning I'm fat. Nice one. Uh, and some, maybe some, and some sort of table as well. So here's literally what you can do. So put the scales, if you put the scales underneath the table and you push upwards, now you will probably need maybe someone to help you read like what sort of measurement it gives, but by pulling, pushing upwards, that is your biceps that is contracting and your biceps that are providing the force. If you put the scales on the table and you push down, that is your triceps, and you can measure your forearm, so put the scales against a wall and literally just push as much as you can with your arm. You can't use your thumbs because they're different muscles, so you've got to do it with the palm of your hands, okay? Like Just like he's doing there, okay? You're just pushing it as much as you can. There's no thumbs. And you might record your results in a table like this. You've got three different muscles. Um, obviously, the scales will give you maybe kilograms, or it might give you it in stone. That's not force. Force isn't measured in kilograms, masses. Force is measured in newtons. So a little challenge you could do if you've done this, can you convert the measurement, the kilogram measurement, into force? What you probably need to do is to go onto Google and find a converter that can convert the kilograms or stones into newtons. Just very quickly, notice, because it's going to be really important for one of the tasks that you have to do. Notice how I've done my table. My independent variable, the thing I changed, is on the left-hand side. My dependent variable, what you measure, is on the right-hand side. And notice my dependent variables have units. All headings should have units, if they are. There isn't a unit for muscle, so we don't have a unit there. Independent variables, the one you change. Independent variables, the one you change. Dependent ones you measure, if you don't, you feel displeasure. Independent variable is the one you change. Because the independent variable always goes first in the song, that means you have to put it first in the table on the left. And then dependent one you measure, because if you don't, you feel displeasure, always goes on the right. Cool. Part three, joints. You have to be able to or at least try and understand the different structures and the different functions of joints so that we can hopefully compare them. Um, a joint is effectively any place where two or more bones join together. Most of them are very flexible and that allows your skeleton to have lots of different types of movement. Up and down, round and round. You can do a lot with your body. However, some of your bones are joined really rigidly together. You, they can't move because you don't want them to move. But it's still a joint because there's two bones joined together. So here's the first one we can talk about, the ball and socket joint. So a really nice example of a ball and socket joint in your body is your hips. So it is literally like one bone, so it would be the leg bone, would be going to the hip, the pelvis, and that bone here will be able to rotate in many different ways. And it allows almost a 360 degree rotation, which gives you a lot of flexibility. That's the reason why you can wiggle your hips round and round and you can wiggle your legs round and round because of this ball and socket joint. Now you might think to yourself, well, I've got a leg bone here and I've got a, my hip bone, my pelvis sort of here. These bones look like they're rubbing on each other and they are. The bones are rubbing against each other. The good news is on the edges of these bones where the joints are is a big layer of cartilage which is really strong and it prevents the actual bone rubbing together. The cartilage may rub together, the bone won't. Also between these joints there is a fluid 
called synovial fluid. And again, that helps reduce the friction and reduce the wear every time these bones rub against each other. Hinge joints. Classic hinge joint is like your elbow or your knee, and it tends to be able to move up and down. So they work a lot like a lever and allow a movement of 180 degrees. So you can straighten them and you can bend them up and down, up and down. That's a hinge joint. Here's a type of joint that isn't flexible, fixed joint. When you're a little baby, your plates and your bone at the top of your skull here are not fully fused. And it allows a little bit of a a little bit of flexibility in your skull for when you are born because it's a very small space for a very big head to fit out of so it needs to be a little bit flexible but as you get older um after well after not that long it becomes uh, firmer and firmer until it's fully fused together which of course is incredibly important your skull, your cranium, is exceptionally important for protecting the squishy brain below. Because if you damage that brain, you it, it, that damage is usually irreversible and it, it's 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 life-threatening because your brain controls everything, including your heart beating and your your heart rate, your breathing rate. It controls it all. So, when your bones actually fuse together, it does mean it can't get any bigger, it can't get any smaller but it is a lovely protective layer. That's a fixed joint. The last one is a pivot joint. So you've got lovely pivot joint in your neck. And pivot joints allow bones to rotate around each other 360 degrees. So theoretically, because of your pivot joint, you should be able to spin your head 360 degrees round and round and round to really scare people. That doesn't actually happen because you've got lots of muscles in your neck that prevent it from actually moving all the way around, which is why you kind of, I don't know if I turn my neck, I can kind of turn, I can kind of just see behind me, but I can never actually fully get my head all the way around. That would be horrific, I think, if I could. Anyway, that's my science. So here is the first task that you have to have a go at. It is a 10 question Kahoot challenge. And the questions are all about the skeleton, the muscles and your joints. So don't just go into this willy nilly. Go into this, you know, confident. Make sure you think you know what your skeleton is. Make sure you think you remember those four functions of the skeleton, the names of the different parts. Can you remember what an antagonistic pair of muscles were? Uh, can you remember the different types of joints and different things about them? If you think you're ready, go to www.kahoot.it and there are two game pins you can try. It's the same game, it's the same quiz, uh, but there's two just, um, just to ensure that every student can have a go because each version can only have as 100 students and there's more than 100 of you in a year group so try this one first 0830400 as your game pin but if that one's not working because 100 kids have already done it then use the second one instead 0965066611 i played this now obviously i got all 10 questions right not only did i make the quiz i'm a biology teacher i should get them all right but my old eyes had to try find where the correct answers were. So yes, I got 10 out of 10, but you also get points for speed on this. So my high score was 13,190. If any of you can beat my high score, you're not going to get anything except the knowledge that you're better than me. And isn't that worth it? And this is also all oh, right. This is the bit where you go grab your parent, your carer, your grandparent, whoever's in the house that has access to treats. If you get eight of 10 or more, Mr. Bateson says that you deserve chocolate or something yummy that is edible and mm, yummy. Right? Eight, nine or 10 out of 10, you absolutely deserve chocolate. Parents, I hope you just heard that. Get your child chocolate if they get eight, nine or 10 out of 10. If they get less than that, Ban them. Ban them. No, don't ban them. Um, but I don't know. Maybe you, you'll know if they've worked hard or not. And that's what matters. So please only play once, though. It's my last little bit. Only play once. Because, again, only 100 kids can do that, that one. Only 100 kids can do that one. So um, if you play more than once, I don't, really, I don't want it to run out, you see. I want everyone to at least have a go. Good luck. Okay, doke.
when you're ready. The next bit is part four, breathing. So part four, the gas exchange system. You have to be able to understand the structure and function of your gas exchange system in humans and the mechanism of how you breathe. So on the board, on this little screen here, you can see, hopefully, uh, the gas exchange system and all the organs that make it up. It's not just your lungs, it's all lots of organs as well. So my little red line here, this is going to be air. Air comes in, into your mouth, and it goes down your windpipe. The posh name for the windpipe is the trachea. That is not the tube that goes to your stomach. That has nothing to do with food. Food does not go down your windpipe. Food goes down the food pipe, which is called the esophagus. They are right next to each other. You can't see the esophagus on this diagram. They've deleted it. But I assure you, when you get dissecting, when you get to year 9 and 10, they are right next to each other. But this is the trachea. Only air goes in and out. So when you breathe in, the air goes down through the mouth, down the trachea of the windpipe, and it goes down, 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 until it splits. This windpipe splits off into two. Now, these two tubes here, they are both called bronchi. Okay, bronchi, B-R-O-N-C-H-I, bronchi. And the air then keeps going down the bronchi and the tubes split off again into lots of different parts. Now these slightly smaller tubes are called bronchioles. Bronchioles, B-R-O-N-C-H-I-O-L-E-S, bronchioles. And the bronchioles branch and branch and branch until they get to these little circular bits, which are your air sacs. And their posh name is alveoli. And it is in the alveoli where oxygen, which you've just breathed in from the air, diffuses into blood. It's not the only thing that happens in the alveoli. Also in the alveoli, carbon dioxide which is a waste product from respiration in your cells, carbon dioxide that is in your blood will diffuse into the alveoli air sacs. And then when you breathe out, that carbon dioxide moves up the bronchioles, up into the bronchi, up the windpipe, up the trachea, and eventually out the mouth. So you're constantly breathing air in and air out. And you're doing that, the air in, is because you want the oxygen in the air to get to your alveoli and then diffuse into blood. Because once the oxygen in the blood, the blood can take it all around the body to any cell that needs it. But you're also breathing to remove waste, to excrete the waste product carbon dioxide. And that's why you breathe out more carbon dioxide than you breathe in. The air in the atmosphere is about 0.04% carbon dioxide, yet the air you breathe out is 4%. So you breathe in 0.04% CO2 and you breathe out 4% because you make so much of it as a waste product. So we don't just breathe to get oxygen into our blood. It is just as important to breathe to remove carbon dioxide as waste. Okay, the other little bits uh, on this diagram that you can see, um, each of these, I'm just going to colour in a rib. In, there's one rib in blue. There's a second rib in blue. There's a third rib in blue. And there's a fourth rib in blue. And in between those ribs, this isn't labelled, but this will be important, in between those ribs here, I'm colouring in red, are muscles. The muscles in between your ribs are called inter, I-N-T-E-R, oh, this is bad, isn't it? Costal, C-O-S-T-A-L. <laughs> I'm trying so hard with this laptop mouse. <laughs> muscles, M U S. C L E S. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. That'll do for me. Intercostal muscles. So intercostal muscles are between your ribs. Uh, you can see the lungs. Obviously, you've got two lungs. That's all of this bit, all the alveoli, bronchioles, bronchi inside those lungs. And the final bit, 
singles will know this one. There is a sheet of muscle at the base of your ribs called the diaphragm. I know, it's got a random silent G in it. When I'm in classroom, I usually, I usually tend to pronounce it diaphragm, so you remember how to spell it. But the diaphragm is a sheet of muscle at the base. The entire reason why you breathe in and out is that diaphragm. Let me show you. When you breathe in, which is the diagonal on the left, the diaphragm, the sheet of muscle, contracts. And it contracts and it pulls itself downwards. It moves down. By moving down, what you've just done is you've created a much larger volume inside your chest. It's bigger now, isn't it? Now it's moved down, it's bigger. Your chest is now bigger. Bigger volume. At the same time as that diaphragm moves downwards, the muscles between your ribs, those intercostal muscles, contract and pull the rib cage up and out. Again, making your chest bigger. If you don't believe me, literally put your hands on your chest right now and take a really big breath in. <sighs> you should be able to feel your chest getting bigger. Okay, your hands would have gone up and out as your chest expanded. Put that all together, this is what is actually happening. By the diaphragm moving downwards and the intercostal muscles contracting, pulling the ribs outwards, you've just created a really high volume inside your chest. When you have a high volume, it also means you have a lower pressure of air inside that chest because it's the same amount of air but there's now a bigger space so it's a lower pressure and if that pressure inside your chest gets lower than the air pressure in the atmosphere so if the atmosphere had a higher pressure of air then air will move into your mouth down your trachea down your bronchi down your bronchioles into your alveoli down what we call a pressure gradient from high pressure to low pressure. You don't think about it, it just happens. If your diaphragm moves downwards and ribs move up and out, it's much higher volume, gives it a low pressure, and therefore air moves from the atmosphere into the lungs from a high pressure to a low pressure. Look at exhalation. My favorite thing about teaching about breathing is if you know how to breathe in, you know how to breathe out, it's just the opposite. Look at exhalation. The diaphragm, instead of moving down, now it relaxes and moves up, makes the chest smaller. Instead of those intercostal muscles uh, contracting and pulling the ribs out, now they relax and they make move the ribs inwards. Again, prove it. Put your hands on your chest and breathe out and watch your rib cage get, go, get lower down and get smaller. The net result is now your chest cavity has a lower volume which gives it a slightly higher pressure. And if the pressure increases higher than the atmospheric pressure, so now the atmospheric pressure is lower, then the air will flood out, out the bronchioles, up the bronchi, up the trachea, and then out the mouth to the atmosphere, down the pressure gradient. And that's you exhaling, that's you breathing out. So, there is a op again, option and practical you can do. There is a way that, again, hopefully you can use things that are already at home to create your own model of how lungs work and how you breathe in and out. What you'll need to do, you need to find a empty drinks bottle. It can work with small, if you've got those big two litre ones, that's amazing. It can work with smaller ones as well though. You need to try and find a balloon. Uh, something uh, a little bit of a black bin liner so if you, if you have black bin liners or white bin liners or some sort of bin liner if you can try to get a 30 centimeter circle from that elastic band and if possible masking tape but it it usually works quite well with cellar tape and uh, other types of tape as well so what you need to try and do is you're pushing the balloon through the top of the bottle as so shown here and you're folding the bin bag so the bin bag goes over the base of this cut up bit of two liter drinks bottle you should hopefully end up with something that looks maybe a little bit like that. 
and you should be able to pull and push the bin liner at the base. And if you pull it and move it outwards, well, what you're doing there is you're replicating the diaphragm contracting and moving down, which means you'll get a higher volume inside the bottle, therefore a lower pressure inside the bottle. So you hopefully will get air rushing in, flooding in to the balloon. So hopefully you'll be able to watch the balloon inflate. So modeling breathing in. Likewise, if you want to model breathing out, you would push the, push the bin line a bit in, giving it a lower volume, a higher pressure, and therefore air should move out. So you'll hopefully see the balloon deflate. Give it a go. Try your best. If it absolutely doesn't work, but you want to see how it would work, go on YouTube and search for this practical, OK? There's loads of examples of how it can work. So give it a look. Right, here's another little, little task you can have a go at. Can you write a story of why air moves into your lungs? And an extension could be to continue that story with how air moves out of your lungs. I'll just give you a starting point, just for everyone. If you want to talk about why air moves in, that's inhalation. And the first step is always the diaphragm contracting, moving down. Can you write the rest of the story all the way until air floods, moves into the lungs. Give it a go. Okay, then. so hopefully you've now done that task, if, if you have, because what I'm going to do now is go through it. And I'd like you, please, if you've done it, to mark it in a green pen like you would if we were at school. If you've not done it yet, then obviously pause me and get it done, okay? And then play me again when you're ready. So diaphragm contract moves downwards and then those intercostal muscles between the ribs contract, pulling the ribs outwards. That increased the volume of the lungs, gave the lungs a high volume, which, gave, uh, which decreased the pressure inside the lungs, so decreased the pressure, lower pressure. And when the pressure inside the lungs is lower than atmospheric pressure, pressure of the air, air will move into your lungs from the atmosphere. If you've had a go at the extension, well, exhalation would just be the opposite. So the diet would be the diaphragm relaxes and moves upwards. The muscle between the ribs relax, moving the ribs in. It decreases the volume of the lungs, which increases the pressure inside the lungs. And when the pressure inside the lungs is higher, the atmospheric pressure air moves out of your lungs to the atmosphere. So it would just be the opposite for exhalation. Coolio. Last thing to do, guys. We need to look at the impact of exercise on the gas exchange. So I am now asking you all to carry out an experiment at home. And I want you to experiment on different types of exercises and which affects your breathing rate the most. Here's what you need to do. Step one. You have to choose someone who is going to carry out the experiment. So it could be you. You could carry it out. You might be able to rope a parent in to do it, uh, maybe a brother or sister, or even, even a pet, potentially. don't know, maybe. All you need to make sure is, guys, number one, if you choose anyone other than you, uh, you must obviously get their permission. And if they're a child, that means you must get their parents' permission. And if it's a pet, then definitely get your parents' permission. OK, the owner's permission. That subject must be in good health and free from respiratory illness such as asthma. So you need someone to do this who doesn't have asthma or any other respiratory illness. And they must be in good health. OK, that is absolutely essential. That's your health and safety. Okay, that. Step two. When you've picked your subject and they're happy to take part, you have to measure their breathing rate at rest. So how many breaths do they take naturally every minute when they're at rest? You then have to get that subject to perform exactly one minute's worth of an exercise of your choice. So maybe you can make them, I don't know, 
walk quickly round the garden. That'd be a nice one. Maybe some star jumps. Maybe you can really mean and send them to like sprint for a minute. I I don't know. But you obviously you and your subject, you need to choose that between. You've got to obviously be on the same page there. Um, see see how persuasive you can be if you want to be mean. And immediately they finish that exercise, you have to measure their breathing rate again. Allow the subject's breathing rate to return to resting levels and then repeat. But this time, do a different type of exercise. But again, for exactly one minute, doing it for one minute is a control variable that you've got to keep the same to make sure it's a fair and valid test. And please record your results in a suitable results table. So you must have done at least two different exercises, but you are very welcome to do up to a maximum of five different exercises. OK, and do this five different times. This task, you do need to submit parts of it uh, to your teacher via Edmodo for marking. What you need to submit to your teacher is a small introduction to what exercise your subjects did. So just a couple of sentences or a small paragraph and just of actually what you did. So who did the exercise? What did they do? I also want you to give a small amount of detail on what muscle pairs, what antagonistic pairs were used in the exercises that you did. That's a nice little way, isn't it, to think back to your muscle learning. You need to send in a completed results table and then a small conclusion, again, just a small paragraph, stating which exercise increased the breathing rate the most and why you think that exercise increased breathing rate more than the others. Now, your teacher is only going to mark the results table. So everyone's results table will be marked because that's the one that we can, as teachers, are obviously going to be able to be able to give much more specialised feedback to. However, your teacher is going to read the introduction, it is going to read the muscle detail, and it is going to read the conclusion. And if they feel that you'd benefit from some feedback on those parts, then they will give you feedback on those parts as well. OK? And any bit of feedback that you get, you must respond to it in a blue pen by improving your results table, improving your work. Awesome. Right, the next last little bit of this video just shows you, uh, again, a final challenge question and a final bit of extension research that you can do. So, last minute or two. This question is a GCC question. It's a GCC challenge. And I really to clarify, this isn't a simple GCC question. This is a grade 8, grade 9 GCC question if you do it properly. And it's a sort of question which, when I have students in year nine and you first sort of introduce this idea, they all feel very confident at answering. But when they actually read their answers, the science just isn't quite there yet. So this is hopefully, if you have a go at this challenge, because I'm going to go through what that answer would be uh, in a sec. If you have a go at this challenge and then we sort of mark it together, it hopefully be that little just little stepping stone into what well, why is breathing important for GCSE? So give it a go, you know, look things up. What do you why do you think? If you do have any older siblings in like year 10, 11, 12, 13, you know, rope them in. Can they remember what sort of things are going on? What sort of science is involved? Anyway. So hopefully, if you've had a go, hopefully you've had a go by now, because I'm going to go through the answers right now. When we exercise, we contract our muscles more than normal. So the muscles need more energy. And the reaction that releases energy inside all your cells is called respiration, one of the seven life processes. Oxygen is a reactant to respiration. It reacts with glucose, which is a pulse word for sugar, and when they react together, it releases energy and produces carbon dioxide and water. So what I'm trying to get across is when you contract your muscles, when you exercise, you need more energy. And that energy comes from respiration and respiration needs oxygen and sugar. So the more oxygen you breathe in, the higher your breathing rate, 
The more oxygen you take in into your blood, the more oxygen will be available for your muscle cells to do respiration and to release the energy, energy needed to contract your muscles. So the more oxygen, the more muscle contraction, because you can do more respiration and release more energy. It's all about energy, boys and girls, and energy is all about respiration. Last task. Exercise isn't the only factor that can affect your gas exchange system. Two really interesting factors you can have a look at are smoking cigarettes and asthma. So if you've got time to have a little extension task, have a little good research of what cigarettes actually do to your gas exchange system. What, is, what damage do cigarettes actually do to your lungs? If you're asthmatic like me, what does that actually mean? What is actually happening on those random moments in your in your life as an asthmatic where your your windpipe and your and your your trachea, your bronchi just decide to close, which means you can't breathe. And following if you do an asthma watch, follow it up with, especially if you're asthmatic like asthmatic like me, I have a blue inhaler. It's called salbutamol, it's the type of drug I eat. Um, and when I take my blue inhaler, instantly, almost instantly, I can breathe again. Why? What, what is what is the drug doing inside my, my gas exchange system, inside my windpipe and my bronchi and my bronchioles? What is it actually doing which allows me to somehow be able to breathe again? Okay, so I'm at the end. I hope, I hope doing it this way has been really useful. I hope. We're all trying new things as teachers at the minute to try and find the right way to help you learn, but also enjoy your learning in a way that is just a completely different setting to normal. So I hope this was useful. Again, if you've had any issues or any problems with meeting the couple of week deadline for the uh, like the results table where I'm doing that Kahoot quiz, you just have to get in touch. All right. You just have to get in touch if you're finding that difficult. It is not a problem. You just have to let us know. So, peace out, everyone. Thank you very much. And Mr. Bateson, send amazing feedback if you've got it through to the school if you like this. Right, take care. Bye.